underwriting deals is such a major pain point for people. Most don't want to do it, and the people that are good at it are few and far between. That is why after six years of being in the industry and buying over 1,200 apartments, using my best-selling multifamily deal analyzer, I created Real Estate Lab, a full suite acquisition software for multifamily investors. We have built a product that helps investors automate their acquisitions and close more deals all in a cloud-based platform. You can go to realestatelab.com and sign up today using the promo code TAG2 for 10% off your first 12 months. This is David Tupin. Thanks for listening. Welcome to The Apartment Gurus, where twice a week, host Tate Seymour brings you deep dive interviews with the wisest gurus in the apartment investing industry. These experts are sure to create game-changing value and inspiration designed to catapult your business to the next level. Be sure to reach out to Tate at www.investwithgreenlight.com for access to his investor portal and Calendly link. And now, here is Tate Seymour and the Apartment Gurus. Welcome, everybody back. Another episode of The Apartment Gurus is coming at you. Formerly the apartment guys, and we're going back to the apartment guys format today because my uh, partner in crime, Chelsea, is in New York City on business, and uh, it can't unfortunately join us today. But it's it's my my friend uh, James Kandasami and myself. Uh, we're gonna provide a ton of value today. James has been very successful in this in the multifamily space, uh, three thousand units. Uh, of existing value add class, uh, class mostly class B. It sounds like James. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah. And then uh, also he's done a thousand units of of new build, um, ground up multifamily. So uh, you said about nineteen deals you've done. Yeah, nineteen deals, including <laughs> the ground up. I mean, ground up. A lot of it is under development right now. We're going through entitlement, but the first ground up construction is going to be a uh, breaking ground next month. So we are very excited. It's 324 units of multifamily. Where, what, what markets are those in or what in market San, is it? in San Antonio, Texas? Nice. Great market. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Most really. of my deals are in San Antonio and Austin, Texas. Yep. That's a great, and they're, they're great sister cities. They're just mm-hmm. down the road from each other. What about two hours apart? Something like that. No, it's one, one hour. Something can be 45 yep. minutes. Very close. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Those are, Austin is a crazy vibrant market and San Antonio is not far behind. So absolutely. James, it's awesome to have you on the show. I appreciate you coming on, man. Sure. Absolutely. Tate. I mean, happy to add value to your audience. Yeah. Perfect. So um, if you would just um, kind of share with, with us what, you know, kind of your story, uh-huh. um, how you got into real estate, uh, you know, how you got to where you are now, and then uh, we'll kind of, dive into, um, you know, some, some good stuff around, uh, passive investing, the current market changes and that sort of thing from your perspective. But if you could just kind of illuminate us on, uh, give us some color on who you are and, and, uh, and, and, you know, how you got to where you are today. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I started on, uh, I'm, I'm going to, I'm started my career, uh, working as an engineer, as electrical engineer. I did my MBA and I did my CCIM later on. Uh, but I basically started my uh, real estate stuff uh, as a single family buyer. We starting in 2013, we bought like almost 13 houses, 2013 to 2015, mm-hmm. uh, build up almost 400,000 of equity there. Uh, and then uh, later flipped to multifamily. Uh, we started with 45 units, 174 units, 100, you know, 115 units. And, you know, biggest we have is, 346 units uh and now we have sold uh five out of the 16 existing asset deal that we have sorry five out of 13 deals mm-hmm. and we have remaining nine assets uh, we have one more going under contract soon um so we are very active in the market but you know um we do both uh construction as well uh we have like almost uh, 500 acres under development right now with uh almost thousand units of apartment as i said one of it is going to be breaking ground next month so so we're excited about that that's awesome uh, so let's let's just go back for a second to 
the single family days because uh, mm-hmm. you know a lot of us. I, I came from the single family space. Uh, yeah. A lot of my, a lot of my listeners are either in single family and wanting to get into multifamily or followed that path. So, uh, what you know, it sounded like you you know you had some success. You built up some equity, but what what was the like defining factor or moment that caused you to get into uh, into the multifamily space? Um, I think time and scale is the biggest problem that we have in single family. I mean, yeah, you can own the entire deal yourself, uh, you know, but you know, we are, we got limited after like 11 houses. Right. And after that we did two more flips and we said, this is too much work, too much insurance, uh, expiry yeah. dates to track, um, you know, too much direct management. Uh, and we know we were good at real estate. So we said, let's go into multifamily. Uh, so scale and time factor is the biggest uh, uh, driver for us to move from uh, single family to multifamily, right? So, um, yeah, that was the biggest thing. And and also, um, you know, it's all about, uh, we're also looking, f- long term, we're looking at generational wealth as well. So we have started buying deals ourselves. So we recently bought 170 units multifamily just myself, right, without investors. So that's the mm. long term goal that we have. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, I think for I think a lot of people when they're in the single family space, it's a mindset thing, right? Like you know apartment buildings are out there, you know investors are doing them, but when you're in a single family mode, you're doing transaction after transaction. It's not really a scalable relational um business. And you know, some people have like this aha moment uh, uh-huh. sometimes where, you know, they're just doing the course of business. And then like for us, we had a 12 unit apartment, uh, community literally just about fall on our lap here in Utah. And, uh, that was the first time that we ever took a serious look at the underwriting of a, of a commercial building. And, you know, in addition to the time and the scalability that James mentioned, I'll, I'll just add that there's an aspect of speculation in single family that you don't having commercial because the valuation of single family is based on comps, which are are in in an appraiser's opinion. So you've got the variability there of, of what the property is going to actually be worth when you're done with it. And you're, you're also speculating that somebody's going to come along and buy it for what you think they're going to buy it for. And then that's without knowing for sure. Right. Versus a, versus a commercial property, you have uh, a cap rate and an NOI, and those are the two determining factors of uh, value. And uh, it's just, and you and you've got cash flow. You've got, you know, you've got rents that are paying bills and and paying debt service. Uh, so not only is it less speculative, in my opinion, but it's a lot less risky ultimately. Even though the deals are a lot bigger typically, um, so uh, you know, for for the single family folks that are out there and thinking about multifamily, I think it's really a matter of a mindset shift uh, from, you know, thinking of thinking about a transactional space to going to a relational space where you're playing the long game and you're, you're, you are doing commercial deals. And I've always been of the opinion that if somebody else can do it, I can figure out a way to do it too, probably just like they do it. And, uh, yeah, I think that's served us well along the way. Um, do you remember like, you know, kind of making that transition and do you remember like having a mindset shift or did you just always think that you could, that you could do it? Yeah, absolutely. Mindset shift. But before mindset shift, I think any single family guys listening out there, the problem with multi single family guys, because I was one of them as well. It's just you have to change your network, right? Network of friends. Yeah. If you are if you are within your single family guys, it's like herd mentality, right? Everybody thinks that's the best thing in the world, right? You just keep on doing as it is, and you never talk to multifamily guy, or you never get any mentoring from a multifamily guy. You never seen underwriting in multifamily. You never seen what multifamily works. You know, you, yeah. you do not know, right? Um, so you first you have to change your network of friends uh, or you know people that you work with or talk about. Change that first, then go to multifamily meetups, go to talk to people, listen to this kind of podcast which talks about apartments. 
then you have to have a change of mindset you need to be really hungry enough to change yeah right if you're not hungry enough you you know you're going to stay in a, a single family right so uh, because multi family is not only buying multi family right it's also capitalism right now you're raising money from others to buy this large multi family yeah right? if you're buying a smaller one probably you can do it yourself but uh the name of the game is to buy large multi family um uh, you can start small and accumulate it as well it's, it's going to be slower um but i think yeah i mean the change of network and change of mindset and how hungry every anyone is to jump to multi family is very key because i know a lot of people who want to jump to multi family they could not do it uh either they're not hungry enough so they don't have the drive they don't have the passion yeah they don't have the you know they don't need to do any hard work to go into multi family right so uh and they don't want to do it right yeah. so if you don't want to do it just you know either you do continue doing your w2 job or you do it to single family right so but there are people out there who, who are really really hungry who breaks out into multi family and and that's very key right and, yeah. and one more other factor is risk tolerance right because now you are when you're syndicating you're also raising money from others so basically you're taking money from the investors which means you are accountable for other people are yeah. you able to do that are you able to communicate to them are you able to raise the money are you able to sell your you see more sales tactics comes in more accountability comes in at the same time um you know um you know your your world has changed now you're no more is your own asset right you are sharing asset with somebody else yeah somebody's yeah. going to be monitoring you yeah one of my mentors uh, tim brat says it's better to have a slice of a watermelon than all of a grape and mm-hmm. you know that's really like you, you you can do the 20 units the 15s the you know the 30s and you can probably pull it off yourself or with one other partner or capital partner but um you're never going to bust into the 150 unit space without partnering up bringing in uh the partners that you need to fill the gaps and what you have and uh it, it's the, you know you, we say this all the time this is a team sport and if you are a solopreneur and you want to be a solopreneur um there's ways of you could you could raise capital in this space as a solopreneur and do probably pretty well with it but um as far as being an operator and doing these deals um uh, as from a, a high level it's a team sport and you know you're sharing the watermelon right you're not you're not running the grape yourself. So uh-huh. um I think that's a great point and it, you know to speak to your point on risk tolerance um I would actually you know I would I would agree with you and I would also make the point that in my opinion ultimately commercial real estate in general is is more risk mitigated than single family flipping you know speculative uh-huh. flipping um because kind of what I said before about the valuation process um the income process you know the the fact that you've got income and and revenue uh-huh. coming in uh-huh. yep. to pay the bills so it's just it, it's when you're thinking about making the shift and you haven't done it yet it feels risky because like you said James where you're bringing in uh you're bringing in other people's money and that's that's a huge responsibility uh-huh. however i think you need to remind yourself that what you're providing in the way of opportunity for these investors is not insignificant and uh you know it's not like there's all kinds of like this opportunity out there like you you actually have something that's somewhat scarce in the way of like a great a great opportunity for passive investors to come in and uh and invest and do very very well in a lot of cases they're doubling their money in 3 to 5 years and and uh you know they are not doing any of the work, right? And they also yep. have the most security in the deal uh because typically they have more ownership as an LP than a GP does and uh and they get paid first, right? They get a preferred uh-huh. payment. So yep. um yep. so it's kind of, you know, when you talk about risk mitigation, um everybody needs a place to live and and so we're offering a product a we are we're a business in a box as an apartment community that happens to be offering a product that everybody needs and uh so whether you know you, you look at self storage you look at some of the other commercial you know office retail etc there's not this there's not this um universal need that you're necessarily filling like you are with apartments so you know you, your volatility should be a little lower uh than other asset classes and 
you know, especially going into a shifting market or, you know, potential recessionary market, uh, that's, that it helps you sleep at night to know that people are still going to need a place to live and they're still going to pay rent. And in fact, when inflation goes up, rents go up. So it's really a hedge against inflation. We talk about that a lot too. Like investing as a passive investor in these deals is a hedge against your money deflating in value because it's going to, it's going to be part of a, uh, a, you know, a NOI increase, if you will. So, mm-hmm. yep. um, yeah. So my little take mm-hmm. on the risk factor. You, yeah, you know, yeah. 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 I was talking, I was talking, yeah. I mean, in terms of risk, I understand on multifamily, I was talking about ability to take risk as an individual, right? Yeah, so not yeah. everyone is able to take that kind of risk when you're going to commercial space, right? If you're buying one house on your own, you know, it's your own money. If it goes to the ground, you know, you, yep. you you it's your own it's your own deal right but totally. but when you are you know having investors and all that not everyone want to take the risk people are scared to take money and and promise everyone some return and you know, yeah they're worried yep. they can't give the returns right so that that was more of an individual risk tolerance i was talking about yeah that that totally makes sense and i completely agree with that you are actually an author and a pretty uh-huh. pretty accomplished author you wrote uh, really the first book on being uh-huh. a passive investor yep. and commercial real estate. And uh, it's called Passive Investing in Commercial Real Estate by James yeah. Kandasami. So he's holding up that if you're on YouTube right now, you can see the see the book. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. He's holding it up. Um, tell us a little bit about how that book came to be and and what you know kind of the gist of it is, if you will. Yeah. So this book, we have sold almost you know more than 3,000 copies. Uh, we launched it like three years ago. Uh, the gist of it is very simple. There's not much of education for passive investors. Simple and and uh, I mean, it doesn't doesn't. There's not much of marketing in this book. There's a lot of technical stuff in this book because you know I'm I'm, I'm a bit technical. Um, but it does teach you how do you you know uh, select investments, right? A lot of passive investors doesn't know how to select investments, right? So multifamily yeah. investment. There's many three three or four types of multifamily investment. And uh, everybody need to match their life cycle in terms of investing to mm-hmm. the asset class that they're, not the asset class, asset type in multifamily, right? Like, yeah. for example, you have a yield play, you have a value add, you have a deep value add. So three different types of um, multifamily available outside. And based on where you are in your investment life cycle, you want to match that with, with you, right? If you are a young person, you have a full-time job, you know, you don't really need cash flow. Right, so you don't go and invest whatever money you have into a, into a you know yield play deals or core mm-hmm. assets, right? You want to invest deal into a you can take a bit more risk. You can go into a deep value adds because yep. you multiply your equity, right? When you're older and uh, you know you need more consistency, less risk, then you go and invest into core or yield play deals, right? Because yep. that's more less risk, more cash. So so these are the things. There's a lot of advice that I've given based on. You know what we talked about. We talked about different uh, metric structure that we have: IRR, cash flow, average annual return. What's the different meaning of it in a very simple way? So it's a book that you know, if you pick it up and read, you know, at the end of the read, you're gonna really learn. Okay, wow, I did learn so many things that I couldn't have learned from Meetup or podcasts or talking to another passive, right? So, um, so a lot of people have bought my book and gave to their passive investors so that they can. <laughs> They can raise the money, and uh, I'm happy for that. Uh, but um, the book has been out there; it's a popular book. If you go to Amazon, uh, mm-hmm. Amazon is like you know twenty bucks out there. It's like you know four point eight star reviews kind of thing. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, absolutely check it out. And and James, his James' last name is spelled K A N D E A S A M Y. Yes, yes, correct. Um, yeah, so- at the end of the show, I can give a, a free link to get the book a physical book instead okay. of going to going to amazon you can get it from my my warehouse listing okay great yeah we'll 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 touch on that again and then you're also writing a new book that hasn't been published yet uh yeah. tell us about that one yeah i mean uh so that the second book is called uh smarter doctors you work hard make your money work harder uh it's basically a medical professional guide to passive investing uh, and the reason I wrote that book is a lot of, uh, I, I have quite a number of uh, medical professionals uh, investing with me and they don't have any book and they have a big, uh, um, you know, so many people bombard them with advertisement, mutual fund, 
um, you know, uh, stocks and all kind of things. They never heard about syndication, right? Most of my investors. So when I, so a lot of them told me that, hey, we need, uh, you know, we would have been happy if you have found the syndication model way ahead in our investing cycle. And I wrote a book for specifically for them because now they have to take it and read it because it's written for them, right? So yeah. um, they can't say, and in their book is a very third party IP. You know, they are not pressured to do anything. They can read it whenever they want. They can decide whether they want to invest. Um, so that's the reason I wrote a book for them, right? Yeah, and that's a perfect example of of something that comes up on the show fairly often, which is, you know, really dive into a niche, right? Like, um, you know, James is taking on the medical professionals and educating them on how to do this business and how to how to be a passive investor in in these deals. And you know, the more specific your niche is, the in my opinion, the greater chance of success you have, you know, James is going to be considered an expert uh, by doctors and other medical professionals in this space because he wrote a book on the subject. Like you can't get any more knowledgeable and, and more credible than an author that's written a book on, on the subject. So whenever you're making branding decisions or strategy decisions, like my advice is to pick a lane, pick one lane, and really attack that lane. It might, it may or may not end up being the the lane that you ultimately end up in. But the more that you niche, you know, tighten tighten up on these niches and really deep dive into the niches, in my opinion, the the greater success you have. Like, mm-hmm. you know, and that that goes for podcasting, meetup groups, conferences. Like, um, you know, be very specific about what you're up to, and and have it be very well defined. And in, in my opinion. Yep. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you can't, um, it, I mean, you need to have focus. Yep. Yeah. Uh, same thing with some people who does multifamily with self storage, do mobile home parks. You know, there's, there's no real focus in it. Right. So uh, yep. for us, we only do multifamily. We do value yep. add and we do uh, ground up construction. Yeah. It's all multifamily. Super smart. And like, the, again, you want to be considered an expert in these areas. And so if you're mm-hmm. doing, five different asset classes and, and kind of dabbling here and there, you're not going to be perceived as, as like a, a specific expert in the asset class you're in or, or whatever it is you're doing. So, um, you know, I think, I think that's a big takeaway that, that uh-huh. listeners should be taking seriously is get specific about what you're doing and, and write it down, like write down your model, write down your goals, write down your business plan we do a vi- we did a vivid vision for our country our our country our company <laughs> and uh you know we did it right out of the book um by Cameron Harold on uh, it called vivid vision we followed his model and sounds developed- like a vision board copied yeah, to vivid vision it's similar to yeah <laughs> rebranded to vivid vision i guess <laughs> yeah it, i mean a vision board is is very visual and obviously it's 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 graphically representative of what you do uh-huh. the vivid vision that i wrote for our company as the ceo is a, like a six page document that's extremely detailed about everything we're going to be achieving and doing over the next three years and what our team's going to look like, what our office is going to look like, what our culture is, what our core values are, what our strategies are. And, you know, it, when you're just starting out, you may not have all that dialed in right away, but like you want to get serious about getting that stuff dialed in as quickly as you can because your chances of success are going to be a lot better in my opinion. So um, yeah. Any, anything to add to that, James? No, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I use a lot of uh, vision board myself and yep. it, it works wonders. Yeah. There's something magical about a vision board in my opinion. Like, like you said, it works wonders. It's, it's kind of like sometimes kind of crazy how you put something on a vision board and then it just manifests and like without even like focusing on it, it's, it just kind of shows up. Um, so, uh, when, you know, when you were starting in the multifamily space, what, what, you know, you've done 19 deals. Did you have that kind of scale in mind or were you just kind of doing on a deal by deal basis? I was just doing deal by deal basis. I mean, um, we really don't rush in our deals. I mean, we have been doing this for almost nine years right now. Uh, we go very deep into one deal and, and all the deals is owned by, you know, we are the only GP. Right, okay. which is a very unique thing that you see out of the market, right? So we go deep. Uh, we like to do a lot of value adds. 
uh, devalue adds, uh, and you know we play. You know, if you have a binomial curve, we play at the both end of the spectrum. You know, we do deep value add or we do Carnot construction. In the middle, it's uh, it's okay, but uh, we like to play that space because uh, um, that's where your risk become low, even though it's a lot of hard work. Yeah, no doubt. It, it, this is hard work. Like, you know, I happen to love what we do. I happen to love the space we're in and the the assets we're working with and the the people, the brokers, the lenders, the you know, I, I think it's all very high level business, uh-huh. uh, but it's, it's hard work and there's a lot of moving parts. Absolutely. Being a passive investor, just to get back to uh, James book for a second, you're deploying capital and that's it. That's your only role. You sit back and, and wait for the returns to come in, uh, which are often a preferred return, meaning you get paid before anybody else, including the GP. Uh-huh. So it's an awesome position to be in. I think, you know, I, I'm not an LP yet in any deals, but it's way on my radar. Uh, it's kind of, it's kind of a place that you, well, a lot of sponsors want to get to be in an LP, at, you know, when they grow up, so to speak, um, or at least <laughs> yeah. have that, have that in their portfolio. Right. Yeah. My exit plan as a, on a syndicator is to buy deals on my own. Uh, okay. Probably I'll be an LP, but I you know we, we are, you know, we have enough experience and, um, you know, you need a lot of cash to buy deals on your own too, right? So we are trying to go more towards that. As I said, we just recently bought 170 units on our own uh, in San Antonio and has a great market, right? So yep. in a great location. So we were, able fantastic. To, uh, we were able to do that. Yeah. You guys have had a lot of success. Congratulations mm-hmm. on that. Thank you. Um, yeah. And you're doing it in, a, in great markets. Um, you know, your upside is massive, I'm sure. So, uh-huh. um, okay. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the market we're in now, uh, the shifts we're seeing in the last, say, four months, five months, uh, uh-huh. rising interest rates, uh, inflation, p- potential recession. Uh, you know, obviously everybody's underwriting has has had to change and shift, especially just simply because the debt programs are quite different now. They're higher interest rates and lower leverage. Um, what are you seeing in general? And where do you see all this kind of, sh- how, how do you see it all shaking out? I think the market has changed drastically in the past three months just because the interest rate going up, right? And and what's happening right now, the sellers who had expectation of the price now has a big gap with the bias ex- bias right. buying price because they're not getting, I mean, we have go- we have moved from, fixed rate loan to bridge loan pricing in the past two years. There was no virtually yeah. no deals on a on an agency loan happen in the past two years. Very, very rare, maybe less than 5%. 95% of the deal were done with the bridge just because of the pricing has gone up so much, right? So the bridge guys was was uh, was the king there, but now the bridge, the interest rate going up. So now everybody trying to go back to fixed rate loan and it's not possible. The gap is too big. No, we have to go yeah. here. We already like, past two years ago. So now uh, there's a lot of uh, gap between buyers ask and uh, sellers uh, ask, ask as well. Um, so a lot of da- transactions have stopped, right? Uh, there's not many buyers out there buying. A lot of institutional have stopped. A lot of private equity have stopped. Um, the guys who are buying is either guys who are still able to raise money uh, and, and everybody claims rate cap will solve the world. However, the exit cap is unknown, right? What yep. is the exit cap? Because if your interest rate is at like 7 8%, you have to buy at least at that <laughs> interest rate, right? Or you need yeah. to buy some value add, which can take you above above the 7 8%, right? Which yep. nobody's buying at 7 8%. Everybody's buying at 4 or 5 cap right now, right? Even 5 cap is hard to find in, in our market, yep. right? Uh, and you can buy a deal which does value add. And by the time you're done, let's say you buy a deal at 5 cap, and you do a 7 8% value add, all your value adds wiped out when the buyer comes in. Right? You say, I can't pay you that for whatever you've done. I, I need to buy at this cap because that's where I make sense. Yeah. So uh, so the deal type, the deal type need to be really unique, like either a loan assumption or you have to go and get a, a recourse loan from a bank who can give you a fix. You have to put your balance sheet on the line. Yep. Or you have to uh, you know, really find deep value add, which makes sense. Or you really have to hold on for next you know, three years, I guess, right? By the time uh, recession comes back down or the interest rate comes back down because average uh, rate increase is two years, right? right? So, 
but there's a lot of people in trouble because they they past two years as i said it's all bridge loan yeah. and a lot of bridge loans are expiring this year right and they have to bring money to the table to sell it off or they have to refinance right or refi so, yeah yep yeah so the exit cap is the biggest problem nowadays i mean nobody talks about it i know everybody talks about uh, i'm going to put a rate cap and solve my issue you know my rate doesn't go up but how long you're going to hold the property right especially on a bridge loan and people always talk about 3 years 3 plus 1 plus 1 bridge loan but the plus 1 plus 1 is very discretionary yeah yep right so essentially you have 3 years so you guys are still you're still underwriting you're still making offers you're you're still doing your thing right now right uh we are uh, i mean so for me i don't really underwrite all the deals even during good times i don't really look at all the deals um because i am the underwriter and i'm also ceo of the company with 50 people so i'm very stranded right so i did hire an analyst and we did look at a lot of deals but um but i you know a lot of times i usually we will know when we see a deal whether it makes sense or not right you'll get it off market oh uh, you know there's something special about that deal that nobody else have right if you go yeah. on a normal deal where you go to bidding war you're basically bidding yourself right yeah yeah so you said you had 50 employees yeah in your company wow that's that's awesome you see you're pretty vertical on a lot of aspects of the of the business yeah, i yeah. think yep we are uh, we do property management asset management construction ourselves and um i mean t- talk to me a little bit about the team do you have other like key, key part like basically managing partners with in addition to you or how do you have it set up uh it's just me me and my wife two nice. of us nice uh, the ceo of the company we have uh vice presidents of dalman operations and all that um and we have you know few other corporate employees like accounting uh marketing and all that so that's how we have set it up that's so cool i mean that's <laughs> that's a structure that um is going to really i mean be massively you know profitable for you guys and mm-hmm. um you know we i i've got two two other equal partners in greenlight and li- we're very happy with that structure um we're happy with how we work together and you know it's it it enables us to do that many more deals absolutely um, but um you've kind of managed to do you know a lot of deals <laughs> and and just be you know just to have it be the two of you so that's yeah. awesome well partnerships are great right i mean i now i'm looking into partnerships more because the amount of money we are raising is is, is a lot yeah um and prices have gone up so much right and um we're looking at newer asset too right so when we started you know i was able to raise a whole money because we have a good track record uh, with our passive investors and you know um we bring really good deals and we execute them well and give really good returns so word of mouth spreads so uh yeah. you know but absolutely i mean partnerships can get you to grow very quickly yeah um so that's really good i mean the other downfall to partnership but you know you know you just have to manage that i guess yeah talk a little bit about that as far as i mean that's like to me that's like next level mindset stuff like <laughs> you know the the fact that you and your wife can set up build, build this company 50 employees 4000 units what's your asset what's your AUM right now do you know uh 0.5 yeah, yeah. So, yeah okay so half, half a billion dollars mm-hmm. on assets under management mm-hmm. yeah that is awesome james mm-hmm. that's yeah really great Thank you. um <laughs> really yeah. really great um and to, you just started in 2013 doing it 2013 yes this when i started with single family i mean um so see i didn't do a lot of podcasts for past 6 to 7 months just because we have been busy yeah um man i've been a lot of podcasts too right so um yeah. but uh you know uh, we provide a lot of value to people and you know that helps us a lot as well in our growth yeah super exciting um so what's next for you guys are you're doing these new builds uh, are you going to mm-hmm. kind of keep keep pursuing those and stay and work in that lane and the other lane as well or what what are you guys thinking we will we will be doing both you know uh, value add and ground up construction even though now ground up construction makes more sense more i mean in terms of finding deals because you know you have like 2 years to do ground up construction right and hopefully the right. recession come and goes away during that yeah. time uh yeah. value add is a bit tricky right now because you know 
there's no real deal that really going to work nowadays, right? Unless you get a seller financing or you're doing loan yeah. assumption, all kind of things on the debt side of it. And um, it's just a very fuzzy moment right now for existing asset. Yeah, like that's well said. That's, taking, that's a good word. Time. It's mm-hmm. it, that's a good word because there's not a lot of clarity and and kind of where things are headed. I mean, you you know you you always factor in the organic rent growth that goes along with inflation, and that kind that can kind of kind of counteract the rise in, in ca- or the mm-hmm. the um you know the I guess the di- you know the rise in cap rates and um and that sort of thing. Um, you know, at the end of the day, none of us have a crystal ball. Uh, none of us know exactly how this downturn or recession or whatever, whatever it is, is going to play out. Um, I, my thought on this is that, uh, you know, we're, we're still buyers. Like we're looking at deals. We're underwriting deals. We're making offers on deals. We're in highest and best on a $21 million, uh, property in Columbus and working on that. And we haven't put our pencils down, so to speak. And so, um, you know, that said, like, we're trying to buy stuff that we know we're going to keep for at least five years. We're trying to do it with debt that is, is either fixed or is, you know, reasonable. We're typically doing recourse loans right now, um, with, you know, with banks and, uh, you know, if, if you're doing those two things in the property cash flows, uh, which is, is hard to do in Austin, probably a little more, mm-hmm. a little easier to do in San Antonio. San Antonio but, yes. Yes. Correct. Um, but if, if you got positive cash flow and the, the pace, the place is paying for itself now, it's going to continue to pay for itself because your rents will go up with inflation. You you, you kind of see that James, are you seeing yeah, the absolutely. same thing? Absolutely. I don't think so. Anyone should stop. Right. So if you stop, that means you're a speculator or you don't understand investing, right? Uh, during this kind of time, you just have to slow down your car, not stop the car, right? Yeah. During good, good times, you press the pedal you know, harder, so you go faster, right? So during this time, you be more cautious, less aggressive. During yeah. good times, you be more aggressive, you take more risk. If the deal is you know, 50-50, you can buy it during good times, yeah. right? Right, yeah. right now you know you want a deal to be 80 20 80 percent confidence that's going to work then you go and do it yeah so you yeah. change your criteria you probably slow down your buying but you should not stop once you stop that means you you are not really an investor yeah. <laughs> you're basically uh trying to time the market that means you're a speculator yeah totally and and you know warren buffett talks about when when people are greedy you know be fearful and when people are fearful be greedy like uh-huh. There are there are a lot of people that get rich in recessions and become wealthy, uh-huh. uh, and they're not the people that are sitting on the sidelines with their cash under their mattress. Like these are people that are are doing deals and are doing business and starting companies and building buildings and all that stuff. Like life goes on, even in even in an economic downturn. And you know, again, like this universal need for apartments is is very real and housing we're still in a housing shortage uh you know by depending on who you listen to tens or hundreds of thousands of units that the country is short uh and so the supply and demand factor like i don't expect utah i don't expect utah sellers to change a whole lot even in a recession because the demand for property out here is so significant and there's not much land at all to build on anymore uh we're you know we've got a mountain range on one side and a mountain range on the other side and and so we're confined it's it's quite different than like a denver or someplace that can just keep growing and growing and growing um so you know it's going to be market specific i think that the outcome of this the shift the overall shift um and you know you got to make all those choices really really well like james said slow down a little bit um, uh, you know, if you're, if you're, yeah, you know, do, do the best deals that you can do, um, get the best debt you can get, have the best business plan. That's going to like carry you through any potential, uh, recession and, and go make it happen. Like, um, you know, we've got two biggies that we're working on getting closed. And so, yeah. Um, so, okay. So any other thoughts on the shifting market right now, or at least how to strategically deal with it? 
Um, I mean, I give a few examples on how you can still buy deals. I mean, I'm just saying don't rush. I mean, life doesn't change if you don't buy today. Right? I see sometimes a lot of newbies, they want to get a deal. They want to get a deal, right? Yeah. <laughs> because, but keep in mind, if you don't do a deal, your life doesn't change, right? Unless you right. really, uh, you're really not doing anything right now, right? So yeah. if you have a W-2 job, if you don't do a deal, it's okay. You still have your W-2 income, right? That's right. Um, this is still not the best market to buy, but as I said, with some tweaks, you can still get a cash flowing deals and housing in shortage. So um, as what you said, Ted, I mean, uh, you have to keep on looking. Yeah. Yeah. W- well said. And I think that's, you know, hopefully it's a clear point to listeners that, you know, at least as far as James and I are concerned, this is not a time to pack it in and sit on your money. It's probably the worst thing you can do. You need to get it out there working for you, uh, whether that's passive uh, investing or or active investing, uh, it's I think it's even more important now that your money's working for you uh, rather than just sitting and losing value. So, um, okay, so we're, you know we're starting to run up against uh, against time here, James. Um, what I guess you know speak speak a little bit to uh, you know to the beginning investor, maybe in the single family space, maybe just looking to bust into apartments in general uh, from their W2 job or whatever. Um, you know, what would you, what would you tell them are like the important things to be focused on right now? I think main thing is, uh, I mean, evaluate themselves, right? Are they really hungry in their quest for multifamily or multifamily yeah. just sound cool. A lot of people go for this conference, that conference, <laughs> so many conferences on multifamily, yep. uh, but never take action. Right. Yeah, so that's right. you need to take action. Yeah. Right. And um, you have to take that, uh, you have to jump over the cliff, right? Yeah. And you find a deal is not going to be 100% for sure that the deal works. It's always That's right. 60, 70% may not work. And you have to jump that cliff, take that step and do it. Yeah. And right. you got to be willing to act with 70% of the information that you need, right? Like, correct. That's right. You're never going to have 100% of the of the information you need. And, and mm-hmm. so, um, you got to be that there, there is a risk tolerance factor, especially in that, um, you know, you're in a lot of these deals, we're still putting hard earnest money down on it's becoming less of a factor, but, you know, six months ago in these hot markets, people are putting down a half million dollars non-refundable on day one. Uh-huh. Um, so you got to be comfortable That's with, true. That's you got to be comfortable with, uh, with taking risk and, but, um, yeah, I think I think those are great points, and you know, just taking action, like James said, it's um, it, w- whatever that next step seems to be, and as particularly the next like big step, you need to get on that stuff and and just do it. Like the Nike commercials used to say, just you know, just go do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and like you're not reinventing the wheel in this space. There's you know, Tony Robbins says success success leaves clues. And in this space, not only does success leave, leaves clues, but you've got people like James writing books about it that are that are guidebooks, really, for you know, super informative that um, have strategies and the plan and everything in them. So, um, by the way, I want to mention on conferences, I'm actually I'm a really big believer in going to these conferences. I think, in fact, I think they offer a value that really nothing else does as far as like getting you into a big room uh, full of people that are ideally doing a lot of business. And especially when you're a beginner or a novice and you've done a deal or maybe you haven't putting yourself, you know, James talked earlier about surrounding yourself with just different kinds of people. When you make that shift, going to these conferences, there's nothing like it, in my opinion, to, you know, like, Jake and Gino's conference last year had 800 people there and it's great, you know, high end speakers, high end operators, capital raisers, et cetera. Um, and you can't duplicate that um, in any other format, in my opinion. So, yep. Um, yep. No, absolutely. I mean, conferences are very highly valuable. I just see some people go for all these and never take action. That's right. You do see that a lot. And and going to a conference is not taking massive action. It's it's putting yourself in the right room mm-hmm. and surrounding yourself with the right people, but it's not moving the needle in your business in terms of getting deals and getting dollars, which is really what this business is. So James, this has been a great conversation. I 
I really appreciate you and, and, uh, I congratulate you on all, all your success. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, you know, I look, look, this is, this is me putting myself in a bit in a bigger room when I have somebody that's mm-hmm. done 4,000 units or has 4,000 units is, is done even more, you know, we're at, uh, we're at 600 units right now. And that's, you know, that's great, but it, it levels me up to have a, an in-depth conversation with somebody like James, because I'm just thinking more like him now. And he's shared a lot of ideas with me and a lot of perspective. Sure. And so, um, you know, and listeners like you're doing the right thing too. Like if you listen to this point in the podcast, and you've really taken it in, like you're putting yourself in the same room that James and I are in. And, uh, and that makes a big difference. It's not everything you need. You still need to go out and, uh, and do all the things that it takes to build the business. But, um, you're definitely doing something right. And, uh, awesome. so I congratulate our listeners, uh, for, you know, for taking the steps to educate themselves and, and move forward, um, as well. So, um, James, what's, what's the best way for listeners to reach out to you and get in touch with you? Uh, just go to my website, achieve investment group, like achieve is like achieving a goal, A C H I E V E yep. achieve investment group.com. Yep. Um, my email is james at achieveinvestmentgroup.com. If anybody want to, you know, see the deal flow, you know, go to my website, achieveinvestmentgroup.com and there's an invest with us button. And if you want to get this book for free, I mean, uh, you pay like four ninety five shipping fee, okay. you go to this website called uh, passiveinvestinginrealestate.com, passiveinvestinginrealestate.com. Yep. Uh, you can get that book, uh, physical book for free, uh, which is sold 20 bucks in Amazon. You go there, you pay four ninety five for shipping. Every, every listener should be taking James up on that offer, a free book uh-huh. that's sold thousands of copies and people value, like you guys all should take advantage of that. So, um, so James, thanks a ton, man. This was Absolutely. awesome. Absolutely. Keep us posted on all your successes. I'm sure we'll sure. be in touch and, sure. Absolutely. and, uh, and I, I'm very grateful that you came on the show. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on the show. You bet. And listeners, thank you for listening to another episode. Uh, We love when you leave us ratings and reviews on, on the show, if you got a lot out of it. Um, And uh, you know, we'll, we'll keep doing these and we'll see you on the next one, probably in a few days because we're doing two a week now. So. Wow. That's uh, cool. Yeah. So, (laughs) um, so yeah, take care everybody and and have a good uh, rest of your work day. This has been The Apartment Gurus with Tate Seymour. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe and leave a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. To contact Tate, go to www.investwithgreenlight.com for access to his investor portal and Calendly link. He loves to hear from you and thanks you for being a valued listener. Just a reminder that you are the guru. See you on the next episode of The Apartment Gurus.